<laughs> the Last Duel is a historical drama starring Matt Damon, Adam Driver, Ben Affleck and Jodie Comer and is directed by Ridley Scott. In fact, it's one of two films the 83-year-old Scott has coming out in the space of a few weeks, the other being House of Gucci, which I'm also very much looking forward to. Though not everything Scott does is great, and he seems adamant at ensuring the Alien franchise is driven into the ground, but outside of the Alien movies, his films are always interesting, because he always has such a wide variety of film choices. In general, if you give Scott a good script, he'll deliver. And I've been looking forward to The Last Duel ever since it was announced. It was my most anticipated film of 2021, even more so than The Sopranos prequel, because it sounded like a very cool idea, and it seemed to be reminiscent of Scott's first ever movie, The Duelist, which is one of his best films. I'm a sucker for a good period movie, even if it is dull and dry, if it's able to feel authentic, if it's able to pull me into its world and make itself feel real, and not just actors playing dress up, I'm sold. Can I just point out though that it took me ages to watch this film because I couldn't find it. Literally none of the cinemas in or around my area were showing it and I ended up having to catch a screening at some art gallery miles and miles away from where I live. I wonder if this has anything to do with why the film was a massive flop, financially speaking. But there's also the fact to consider that it came out at similar times to the likes of Dune and Halloween Kills. In any case, whether this film is good or bad, it makes me sad that movies like these mature adult mid-budget dramas, a period one to boot, constantly flop, meaning film studios will continue to take less risks on them. Well I say mid-budget, The Last Duel did admittedly cost a hundred million dollars but you know what I mean, it's a breath of fresh air being able to see something in theatres that isn't a superhero movie or a PG-13 remake of an 80s classic. The Last Duel could have easily been PG-13 too. Though the movie is exceptionally violent and deals with mature themes, I can see film execs with itchy thumbs wanting to water down the movie to make it more appealable to wider audiences, and it would have completely ruined the film. But instead, the movie pulls no punches, deals with exceptionally sensitive topics in a very sensitive era of movies, and its reward is that it was a complete bomb. So anyway, what's it about? Well, one way to describe it is that many years ago, legendary filmmaker Akira Kurosawa made a film called Rashomon. It was the movie that put him on the map, the film that introduced him to Western audiences. Though I'm a big fan of him, I was never much of a fan of Rashomon, though the idea behind the film was amazing. A rape of a bride of a samurai is recalled from the perspective of four different individuals, a bandit, the samurai's ghost, a woodcutter and the bride herself. It's such a brilliant idea for a film to have a crime committed and then different people telling their accounts, with each account slightly different based on the perspective of the individual telling their story, what with their biases and the limitations of what they saw. Though I roll my eyes at remakes of beloved classics, Rashomon was one film I watched and immediately I thought, you know what, this is one classic that could really have a great remake if done right. You could take this story template and apply it to a western, a sci-fi movie, or as is the case with The Last Duel, a period movie. Because that's the easiest way to describe The Last Duel, a remake of Rashomon set in medieval France. The movie is based on a book of the same name which is based on a real life incident which is recognised as the final official duel in France's history. A knight, played by Matt Damon, accuses his former friend, a squire played by Adam Driver, a dude with a reputation around women, of raping his wife. Because there's loads of politics with him being something of an unpopular figure, whereas Driver has friends in high places, Damon challenges Driver to a duel so the duo's fists, blades and spears can do the talking. The movie is split into three chapters, the first telling the story from Matt Damon's point of view, the second Adam Driver, and the third by the wife herself, played by Cormor. And finally, the movie climaxes with the duel itself, a bloody, cathartic and nail-biting affair. There's a little more to it, like for example land that belongs to Damon is taken by a baron and given to Driver, because it adds suggestions and possible speculations and suspicions in regards to character motivations. Sorry if you hear a bit of background noise in this video, there's people doing fireworks. From what I've seen so far from 2021, The Last Duel is my favourite movie of the year and it was worth the wait hunting down venues that were screening the film. It's Ridley Scott on his A-game, it's Ridley in gladiator mode, with a terrific script where the actors can flex their muscles and do their thing. 
and Ridley can play with his toys, his sets, his landscapes, his costumes. It goes without saying at this point, given it's a period Scott film, the film looks brilliant. It really feels like you've been transported back in time. The dudes carrying carts around, the farm animals, the castles, the muddy fields. It feels real and authentic. You can smell the shit from five miles away, to borrow an apt line from Game of Thrones. It feels dirty and gritty. And though Scott does provide those cool landscape and establishing shots that many filmmakers are obsessed with when making period films, he films the movie in a matter-of-factly kind of way, which adds to the authentic feel. This immersion is bolstered by a strong script which gives attention to minute details, like a beggar by a fire asking for alms while titular characters unmount their horses and charge past the beggar, ignoring him. This background character didn't need to be in the film, but inclusions of things like this really make the film feel fuller, fatter and dense, the world more lived in. I'm reminded of the last film I watched in cinema, The New Dune, and I complained about the fact that there's something about the film that just feels so empty, and maybe it's because of a lack of attention to background elements that The Last Duel got so right. When you think of period films, actors like Matt Damon and Ben Affleck aren't the first that come to mind, are they? You just expect at any moment for one of them to drop their accent and start effing and swearing in Boston slang. I know they co-wrote the script, but truth be told, even after watching the movie, I think they were miscast, only based on the fact that we know them as actors from other kinds of films. And it's hard to swallow them as knights in medieval France, especially with Damon's accent wandering at times. Matt Damon can't even grow a beard in real life, so it will be weird for anyone seeing him with one. With that being said, Damon, with his simmering rage, Affleck with his funky yellow eyebrows and Driver, who's a more unorthodox looking actor anyway that kind of fits with the times, were all great in the film and the acting all round was one of the many factors that contributed to the film's brilliance. And the actors had a lot to chew on because nuance, subtlety and progressing in the narrative through visual, physical and facial acting are not just a feature of the film but a necessity given the structure of the movie with the same tale being told three times but in each there are clear differences, seeing as though each is the truth according to the individual's recollection. The acting is subtly different. Sometimes lines are said by different actors in the second or third chapter, and subsequent chapters after the first show scenes from different perspectives, or add new scenes in to contextualise a character or a situation, which makes you as the viewer re-evaluate your position. For example, the first chapter told is Matt Damon's, and he comes across as noble, chivalrous and honourable, which he is to an extent, but in the first chapter we see him as raging headfirst into battles for the honour of his king, and he saves Adam Driver's character from death in a battle. But in the second chapter, we see that Damon is actually quite an insecure guy, more concerned with his own pride and ego, and according to Driver, who this chapter's viewpoint is told from, it was actually he who saved Damon. Damon's lectures and heroic speeches from his point of view come off as whiny moaning from drivers. I love this kind of stuff, the whole unreliable narrator kind of thing. It's done so brilliantly in this film and the different touches to the same scenes being played again means you don't get bored of watching the same scenes played out. Of course, the rape itself is the main plot point and after we are introduced to the affair through the Damon chapter, we are given more detail with Driver's account of the truth, showing his side of the story where, among other things, Damon's wife was flirting with him and playfully teasing him before the actual incident, telling him to stop but in a provocative way. Essentially, she was playing hard to get and he genuinely thinks there was consent. Now, of course, rape and sexual assault is at the forefront of people's minds when it comes to Hollywood, with Harvey Weinstein and other incidents of vicious sexual predators abusing women. And you know the whole thing about when a woman says no, she means no, no matter how the no is said. And then there's other incidents like the Johnny Depp Amber Heard thing where it seems individuals are taking advantage of the Me Too narrative to make themselves into victims. There are so many conversations and controversies regarding treatment of women in the workplace and in particular in Hollywood. So I think The Last Duel is really brave in places with some of the insinuations it makes, especially in chapter 2. I think there's even a meta line referencing this in the film where Ben Affleck says something like, the masses cannot understand these kind of nuances. When Driver tells him that the woman did say no, but the way he saw it, she wanted it just as much as he did. But anyway, then the third chapter, the one from the wife herself, enters the mix, and this turns the entire film on its head, because it goes from, to put it simply, a man defending his wife's honour, to a man and woman doing what consenting adults do, 
to now two men in a dick measuring contest more concerned with their own egos than the woman at the centre of all of this. A woman who was indeed cruelly violated and could be burnt at the stake if Damon loses the duel. For sure, the movie drifts into the Me Too territory in the final stages of the film. It fully embraces the girl power feminist wave we're seeing in practically every movie these days. It actually ends up as the wife's movie, and it's at the detriment to the film ever so slightly. When the title card comes up for the third chapter, where it says the truth according to Margaret Wright, unlike the previous chapters, before the words fade, the words the truth stay on the screen for a little longer. So in other words, the story you're about to see is how it actually happened. But I would have preferred if the movie didn't do this, didn't lean into one direction more than the other, so that we as the audience would have to be the ones who decide who, if anyone, was telling the truth. There was an element of me that thought, if the third story is the whole truth and nothing but the truth, then what really was the point of giving us two previous editions with half-truths and embellishments? That's just me though, and it clearly wasn't what the filmmakers were going for. They were going for the whole woman making a stand in a man's world. And I didn't mind it as much as I have done in other films, because one, much like Mad Max Fury Road, the film is still brilliant, even if it has a feminist angle. Two, Margaret Wright's crusade feels like a genuine struggle of a woman wronged and no one being in her corner but herself. The movie will be marketed as a statement for modern gender politics, but my interpretation is it really isn't. Three, because this really was a woman making a stand in a man's world. It wasn't as if Margaret Wright was playing a victim, she was a victim. And four, the movie is very nuanced with complex characters to such an extent no one really feels like an outright good or bad guy. Except maybe Margaret Wright. But even she has a scene where she regrets pushing for the trial when it could mean making her child an orphan. The film doesn't need anything other than itself to work unlike a lot of politically driven films which are trying to hammer you over the head with a message. Even the uptight mother-in-law is given a scene which adds so much depth to her character and introduces a dilemma for Margaret Wright. Make a stand for what is right and risk death, or take a step back, ignore the atrocity that has befallen you, and survive. And while we're on the subject of nuance, there are some background characters like the king's wife, who I think had no lines, and the baron's wife, who I think only had one, who convey their support for Margaret Wright only via facial expressions. You can tell they believe her, and it's through simply visual storytelling that these two practically non-characters are given their little moments in the film. It's at times like that when I thought, this is a proper movie. This has been made by people that understand people, that understand complexities, human desire, subtleties, etc, etc. But there are a few moments in the film where it can't seem to help itself but inject modern sensibilities into it, Scott's Kingdom of Heaven did similar things with having characters display modern views that seem artificial, like Orlando Bloom's cringeworthy clangor, you've taught me a lot about religion, priest, which no one would have ever said in that time period or situation. There are a few things like that in this movie as well, though not as heavy. Like one part where an official says something like, a woman can only get pregnant if she enjoys the sex. This is science. It felt like the scene was played for laughs, like we're supposed to look down on these fools from years ago with their primitive scientific knowledge. But it feels artificial within the context of the story and the film, because that was the science, or the pseudoscience, of the time, and thus it takes you out of the movie. But there isn't enough of this to make a big enough of a hamper on the movie, and The Last Duel is a brutal melodrama that left me wholly satisfied with my theatre experience. And let's not forget the actual duel itself, which was a gripping scene, so viscero and hardcore. The foley sound effects were awesome, the clanking of the armour, the slicing of pierced flesh, and the slushy sound of tired, exhausted boots thumping in a muddy arena. The movie is also quite funny as well, and is able to effortlessly balance the humour with the more grim themes. This is Ridley Scott's best film in years, one that I thoroughly enjoyed, and I give it an 8 out of 10.